I am pleased to now introduce Dr. Jenna Dockweiler. Dr. Dockweiler graduated from Kansas State University's College of Veterinary Medicine. She then completed her comparative theriogenology residency at Cornell University in 2017 and became a diplomat of the American College of Theriogenologists that same year. She practiced small animal theriogenology and general practice for four years prior, prior to joining our team here at, at Embark Veterinary as a veterinary geneticist. In this role, Dr. Dockweiler supports our many partners across the veterinary and breeder communities, helping them interpret and apply canine genetic screening results. As a reminder, all attendees can post questions and comments in the chat during the presentation. Dr. Dockweiler will answer questions from the audience as part of the live Q&A afterwards. Also, for our veterinary attendees, by attending Dr. Dockweiler's talk today, you are eligible to receive one hour of race-approved CE credit. We will send an email after the event to all attendees with instructions on how to request their certificate of attendance. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Jenna Dockweiler. Thank you so much for that introduction. Again, my name is Jenna Dockweiler. I'm one of the veterinary geneticists here at Embark. I am also a theriogenologist, so we are going to be talking about canine reproductive emergencies today. So here is the outline of everything that we're going to be discussing today. We're going to start with females and then move over to males. And for females, we're actually going to start with eutocia first, so normal birth. So we have to know what normal is before we can understand abnormal. So the gestation length in the dog varies a little bit on how you count. So if you have a date of LH surge, the due date is calculated as 65 plus or minus one day. Similarly, if you have a date of ovulation using progesterone timing, 63 plus or minus one day, so both very tight windows. If you have a vaginal cytology, so a day one diestrix, we calculate the due date as 57 plus or minus three days from that date. But if you have a breeding date, it is 63 plus or minus seven days from the date of first breeding. So that is a two week window in the nine week gestation, which is a huge margin of error. So the first thing to understand is that we can't rely on breeding date alone to tell us when a bitch is overdue. So some premonitory signs of labor that you might see would be a rectal temperature decrease within 24 hours of whelping. This is because progesterone is a thermogenic hormone, so when it drops very rapidly at the onset of labor, it takes a little bit of time for her internal thermostat to reset. The magnitude of drop will depend a little bit on what reference you read. So some references will say greater than one degree drop from baseline. Others will say less than 99 degrees. Uh, it's typically not subtle, usually in the 97 to 98 range. That dro temperature drop only lasts about eight hours, so it is possible to miss it. You might also see very extreme nesting behavior. So some bitches will collect their toys and things throughout gestation, but when she's very uncomfortable, really tearing bedding up, that is suspicious for stage one labor. And then if you see any green vulvar discharge, that's indicative of placental separation. So that green discharge is called uteroverdin. It comes from the very edges of the marginal placenta from the, the marginal hematoma. Um, so when that, se that separates, that green vulvar discharge is present, that means that the placenta is, is separated. So there's somebody inside without any source of oxygen exchange. So stage one labor begins at the start of uterine contractions, which are not typically externally visible, but if you put a tocodynamometer on, you can see them on a trace and ends with dilation of the cervix, which is not palpable in the bitch. Typically, the stage average is about 6 to 12 hours, although it can last up to 24 to 36, especially in primiferous bitches. Stage 2 labor is, of course, delivery of the fetus. 60% of fetuses are delivered in cranial presentation. 40% are delivered in caudal presentation. Both are totally normal as long as all limbs are extended. Some people will call caudal presentation breach. Unless those hips are flexed, it's not a true breach really should only take zero to 30 minutes per fetus at this stage. And stage three labor is of course delivery of the placenta. So stages two and three do occur simultaneously in the bitch as well as the queen. It is very common to get two puppies followed by two placentas. This hasn't been documented necessarily to, uh, hasn't been proven, but 
the thought is that one puppy will come down from one horn, another puppy will come down from the other horn, and then you'll get a placenta from each horn. Retained placenta is pretty rare in this species. It does occasionally occur, but most often if somebody says that they're missing a placenta, the bitch may have already eaten it. As an aside, I try not to allow bitches to eat their placentas. They are very fast. They often get them before an owner is able to. Uh, there's never been a proven benefit to having them ingest their placenta, but uh, it will give them diarrhea if we can get them. All right, now we're gonna move into dystocia or difficult birth. So some maternal predisposing factors for dystocia include physical obstruction of the birth canal. So this can be something like a vaginal mass, a vaginal stricture, a vertical vaginal septum, which is actually not super uncommon. It's caused by incomplete fusion of the Mullerian ducts on fetal development. Uh, so that can certainly preclude delivery of a, a puppy through that canal. Other possibilities would include a, like a pelvic fracture that hasn't healed in perfect anatomical alignment. Sometimes that can narrow things enough to cause a physical obstruction. And of course, breed predilection, so brachycephalics. Brachycephalic breeds have what's called cephalopelvic disproportion, which are the doctor words for fat head and skinny hips. So trying to squeeze a big broad head and shoulders out a tiny little narrow pelvis doesn't always go very well for these guys. Uh, the other big breed group that's overrepresented for dystocia are terriers, which is surprising to a lot of folks. They are fairly moderate in conformation, but they do have a, a high level of uh, uterine inertia, which we are going to talk about in a moment. Obesity can certainly predispose to dystocia, both because adipocytes release some inflammatory cytokines and because of physical obstruction of the birth canal if there's excess fat deposition around that vaginal vault. Some fetal predisposing factors include fetal malposition or malposture. This is less common in litter bearing species than it is in monotuchus species, that like a foal that's all legs and neck versus this little puppy, but sometimes does occur. Any oversized fetuses, often singletons, will have a bit too much real estate and grow too big to pass out on their own. One fetus, again, because he's got too much real estate, gets too big, can't pass through the birth canal. And also one fetus may not signal to the bitch when it's time to go into labor. So we estimate about 40% of bitches will go into labor with one single, single fetus, but that leaves 60% that will not. And it's probably partially breed dependent as well. If you're a Chihuahua with one fetus, you're probably going to go into labor versus if you're a Great Dane with one fetus, you're probably not going to go into labor. So a lot of times we will just schedule C-sections for those girls. Fetal death, both because they don't signal to the bitch when it's time to go into labor and because dead fetuses don't often present themselves properly. So they kind of tend to ball up and get stuck. And then any kind of fetal monsters. So this poor little poodle puppy over here, his mama was pregnant with four on her ultrasound. By the time we took the x-ray at about 60 days or so of gestation, we were down to two. And then by the time we went to C-section, she ended up being overdue. So we weren't gonna let her go more than a few days past her due date. Um, it then one puppy was dead at that point, didn't have a heartbeat. And then we pulled this puppy out. It has a lot of facial deformities. Never figured out exactly what was going on, but I suspect that this little guy didn't have much of a pituitary to tell his adrenal glands when it was time to release cortisol to signal to the bitch when to go into labor. So types of dystocia include, of course, obstructive dystocia. So that could be something like a band, mass, stricture, pelvic fractures that haven't healed in perfect anatomic alignment, or it can be a puppy stuck in the canal. Both fall into the obstructive category. Primary uterine inertia is a disease group. There are a lot of documented causes for primary uterine inertia. This is where the contractions start. They're visible if you're using a topodynamometer, but they fail to organize into any kind of a progressive pattern that leads to fetal expulsion. So several studies have found low oxytocin, some have found incomplete luteolysis, low calcium, some have found complete luteolysis, normal calcium, normal oxytocin. So there's probably a variety of causes that all lead to the same disease group, but they all present the same and they're all treated the same. So we lump them all into the same disease category. Secondary uterine inertia, the classic example of this is there is an obstruction, 
The bitch is pushing against that obstruction. She's pushing, pushing, pushing. That obstruction is relieved and suddenly she's no longer able to push. So it's essentially just myometrial exhaustion. Then any kind of systemic illness or maternal compromise can lead to a dystocia as well. And of course, fear or inexperience. It, cat, dogs are not quite as good at this as cats are in voluntary inhibition of labor, but sometimes it does play a bit of a role. So diagnosis of dystocia, again, prolonged gestation length, thinking back to our first slide here. So greater than 72 days after the first breeding is when we consider them overdue. So as we learned, that can be totally fine or totally not fine. Without some more information over just a breeding date, it's very difficult to tell the difference. Greater than 66 days post LH peak and greater than 64 days post ovulation, so much tighter window for those two. If we've got four hours after the onset of stage two labor, so this is some visible contraction with no puppies produced, I want her to come in and be seen. If we've got more than two hours between deliveries of fetuses, some references will say four hours between deliveries of fetuses. They do definitely take breaks, but without being able to measure fetal heart rates, it's really tough to tell the difference between a break and a problem. So I do want them seen if there's more than two hours between delivery of fetuses. If we have very strong and frequent stage two labor contractions that don't produce a puppy within 30 minutes or don't show any progress within 15 minutes, uh, there is a subset of breeders that is going to be comfortable performing digital vaginal exams on their own bitch to assess progress. Uh, she should definitely be seen. If there's a large amount of hemorrhagic vulvar discharge at any time, that is a bit concerning. There is, of course, a lot of discharge, uh, but frank blood really isn't super normal, and it can be uh, suspicious for uterine torsion, which is fortunately very rare in this species, but unfortunately does typically present with sudden death. So if you're going to have a, a premonitory sign of that, it's probably going to be very, very bloody vulvar discharge, so that's a cause for concern and investigation. And then again, if you have that presence of utero burden, so that green black discharge prior to delivery of the first puppy and nothing's happening, then that is cause for concern. Um, after the first puppy, there's kind of discharge here, there, and everywhere. It gets tough to tell what belongs to who, but certainly if you see utero burden and there's not a puppy immediately forthcoming, like within the next 15 minutes or so, then that is that is potentially a problem and needs to be investigated. And then if the dam is ill or distressed at any point, so I would say that parturition is stressful, but she shouldn't be distressed. So you have your possible dystocia bitch that comes in. So of course, the first thing that you're going to do on any patient is a complete physical examination. In a pregnant bitch, that is going to include a digital vaginal exam. You're looking for a few things. One, of course, puppies stuck in the birth canal. Two, any kind of other obstruction that's going to preclude a vaginal birth. Typically, if they have some other kind of obstruction, like a mass, a stricture, a band, whatever, they're not going to be able to breathe naturally. So we often have a clue that this could be a problem down the line, but sometimes they will surprise us. And then the third thing you're looking for is Ferguson's reflex. So this describes where the walls of the vagina are stimulated. That results in oxytocin release, and you should get some contraction. If you don't see Ferguson's reflex, medical management is unlikely to be rewarding. So it's something, something to know for sure. I do like to do blood work on these girls. I like to run an ionized calcium. Typically, hypocalcemia will occur two to three weeks or so post whelping. That's when lactation demands for calcium are the highest. But every now and again, we will see one at the time of, of whelping um, and we do, will need to treat it. It can cause dystocia. So to evaluate our litter, we are going to assess our fetal heart rates. If you don't have an ultrasound, you can use a Doppler for this purpose as well. So less than 150 beats per minute is considered a true emergency. Ideally, should be into a C-section within about 15 minutes. 150 to 180 is moderate distress, C-section within 30 minutes, and then greater than 180 is considered no distress. So a transient decrease in fetal heart rate will occur during a uterine contraction. So if you see a puppy that's kind of marginally a little bit low, it's worth watching him for like a full minute to make sure it's not just because of a uterine contraction passing over him. 
if you've got a puppy with a nice fast heart rate, that's fine, move on. But if you have one that's a little bit slow, like in that 150 to 180 range, then keep, keep eyes on them and make sure it's not just because of a contraction. Sometimes you'll have a bitch come in with some on the ground and some still within. So those delivered fetuses should right themselves when they're placed on their back. So roll back onto their ventrum. They should root, which is seat seeking behavior. So the way that I kind of measure that is make a, a little circle and put it in front of their nose and they should kind of push into it. And then of course they should exhibit a suckle reflex as well, um, which is a good time to check for cleft palate. All right, so dystocia treatment. Manipulative treatment is fairly limited by small patient size in most cases in this species. The cervix is not palpable in the bitch, so you're not going to be able to tell if it's open or closed. We are in probably close to a foot uh, when we breed bitches endoscopically, so you're not going to be able to feel that cervix. Typically, oh, you only need your fingers and lube uh, to, to unstick a stuck puppy. What I like to do is pass a red rubber catheter cranial to that puppy and kind of push lube in using like a big catheter tip syringe to try to get it cranial to the puppy and try, kind of drag that catheter back and get it around the puppy as well. If you need to use an instrument, a spay hook is a decent choice. Sometimes you can use that to, you know, pull a leg forward or turn a head or, or whatever you may need to do. It's unlikely to cause a lot of damage to the area. Most importantly, if you're not making progress in five to 10 minutes, a C-section is indicated. It is much better to go to C-section before you're tired, before the bitch is tired, before all your staff is tired. It is really easy to get caught up when you're doing some obstetrical manipulations. So I always have Siri set me a timer and make sure I don't go beyond 10 minutes. So medical management indications, it's appropriate if our dam is in good health, Ferguson's reflex is intact, no fetal maternal mismatch is noted on radiographs, obstructive dystocia is ruled out, no fetal stress is noted on ultrasound, and we have four or fewer fetuses remaining. So these factors exist together almost never. So over 80% of canine dystocia is treated via C-section, and that's really not a failure, it's just a fact of life. So I've done medical management if, uh, if somebody brings the bitch in maybe a little bit too soon, maybe before she was in trouble, um, and then she's anxious, you know, we kind of have to do something, or in, in some cases, we've done it for financial cases as well. Those are probably the two most common. So the medications that you're going to hear about are, of course, oxytocin. There's your dose for you. So 0.1 to 1 unit per bitch, IM or IV every 30 minutes. This is quite a lot lower than the doses of old, which was 1 mil per bitch, which is 20 units. We have found that very large doses of oxytocin like that result in unrelenting uterine contraction, and that can lead to placental separation. So we definitely don't want to do that anymore. This is thought to increase the frequency of contraction. The other medication you'll hear mentioned is calcium gluconate. Dose can either be given IV with an ECG monitoring or sub-Q, warning the owner about potential tissue slough, which knock on wood I've never seen, but is a possibility. And this is thought to increase the force of contraction. My general rule is up to about three injections of each, kind of becomes a law of diminishing returns after that point. So we like to cut our losses and, and head to C-section if, if we're not getting anything with up to three injections of each of those. So surgical management, the most common indication is fetal distress, so a heart rate of less than 180 beats per minute, far and away the most common reason we go to C-section. Other reasons, maternal compromise and obstructive dystocia that we can't fix very quickly or any kind of anatomical abnormalities or like band stricture, that sort of thing that's going to preclude a vaginal delivery. So we like to clip and dirty prep the abdomen prior to induction. We don't use any pre-medications in these girls. Anything that you give the bitch will cross the placenta. So if she has a nice temperament, I always recommend trying to get a catheter in with her awake. Induced with alsaxalone or propofol, ideally in the OR, surgeon scrubbed in, ready to go, table all set up. Uh, there is one study that showed improved fetal APGAR scores with alfaxalone over propofol, but I've used both very successfully and the, the survival wasn't different in the puppies between the two groups, so certainly either is fine. Maintain on gas. I like to use SIVO. I think they just pop up a little bit quicker and are able to take care of their puppies a bit quicker. 
So that's my preference, but ISO works fine as well. These girls do have an increased risk of aspiration pneumonia, and that is because progesterone will decrease the lower esophageal sphincter tone. So they are more likely to aspirate, especially when they're put under anesthesia. So if there was ever a time to use a non-cuffed ET tube, this is not it. If you can do an epidural quickly, they are awesome for pain control. I like to use lidocaine and Duramorph. Bupivacaine just lasts a little bit too long and she's not able to walk out of the hospital. I do discharge these girls the same day. Don't want those puppies there in the hospital potentially picking something up. So if you can do an epidural quickly, that's great. If you're going to be messing around with it for 45 minutes, then I would just say skip it and move to line block. But if you can do it quickly, they are awesome. I like to do a fentanyl CRI once all those puppies are removed. Certainly could do a single dose of an opioid as well. Can use carprofen or gabapentin to go home. Uh, the Wasaba has approved a single 24-hour dose of an NSAID post-C-section for dogs. Um, I am comfortable with sending a few days home. I also will use a line block and or nocida uh, on the, the incision as well. So the actual procedure, the uterus is exteriorized, which is what we're doing here on the table. Make a single incision into the uterine body. I kind of just let it flop out whichever direction it wants to flop out. So I make most of my incisions on the dorsal surface because it seems like that's the direction it wants to, to come out of the abdomen. Make an incision on the dorsal surface. You got a slightly decreased chance of adhesion to the urinary bladder. So maybe that's a benefit, but certainly plenty of people do it on the ventral surface as well. Puppies are milked out, and I promise you can get them all out through that one incision, <laughs> even though it sounds crazy. The placentas can be left in place if you need to. If they're bleeding excessively, by all means, if they peel out easily, peel them out. But if they're you know, bleeding a lot or whatever, you can leave them in if you need to, as long as you don't suture them in. They should pass on their own. Retained placenta is rare in this species. I like to use an inverting closure pattern. The submucosa is the holding layer as it is in most tubular organs. I always use a Utrecht. Some people will do two layers, like an over -sew layer. Um, either is fine. So how about an end block ovariohysterectomy? So this is where the entire gravid uterus is taken out all in one piece. It's plopped on a table, and then somebody else cuts into it and starts pulling out those puppies and resuscitates all of them. Totally valid technique, definitely can be done. You have 60 seconds from the time you start, you clamp those uterine arteries to start resuscitating all of those puppies. Uh, and it is very labor intensive. You need a lot of people because you're gonna start resuscitating all those puppies at pretty much exactly the same time. Whereas if you're pulling them out one at a time, you have a few seconds at least in between, in between puppies. So this is too stressful for me. This is too stressful for most people that I've worked with. So if I am going to do a stay at the same time as a C-section, I will always take the puppies out first and then take the uterus out. But certainly this is a described technique. So if you are comfortable with it, that is fine. Get asked this question a lot. Lactation is completely unaffected by concurrent OHE. All of those hormones come from the brain. So you don't need to worry about that. For our little fetal resuscitation, each fetus should have its own assistant in an ideal world. Mucus is suctioned from the mouth and nares. You can either use a bulb syringe or a daily mucus trap. Both work great. The fetus is rubbed vigorously to provide stimulation. And when I say vigorously, I mean vigorously. Every single person I've ever taught to resuscitate puppies has been too nice. So I always tell them, you can make friends later. We want him to be screaming now. The only caveat to that is their little ear margins are pretty susceptible to trauma and they tend to bleed very easily. So try not to rub their ears too much. I don't think anybody really does this anymore, but we don't swing puppies any longer. The thought process was if we swing them down like this, we will get some of that fluid out of their respiratory tract. Two things. One, probably most of that fluid was coming from the GI tract and not the respiratory tract at all. And two, there is a case report of a poor little eight-day-old lab puppy that had a coup contra coup type brain injury and some subdural hematoma and things like that and uh, ended up having seizures and being euthanized. So we don't want to cause any head trauma in our little puppies, so we don't swing them anymore. So when these little puppies come out, once they're resuscitated, again, they should right, root, and suckle. They will also have a pretty slow withdrawal reflex. That's about the extent of your neuro exam that you can do on these little guys. 
Also check for cleft palate. Sometimes the cleft palate is pretty far back, so try to stick your finger back as far as it will go. The rectal temperature should be low, so it's usually about 95 to 98 degrees for the first week or so of life. So if you have a little tiny puppy with an adult rectal temperature, that is actually a fever. And it really shouldn't be restless and vocalizing all the time. So we need to keep them warm. They should have a contact temperature of 85 to 95 degrees. They do need to nurse within six hours. This is when their brown fat reserves are depleted. And additionally, they do need colostrum. There's really minimal antibody exchange across that placenta. So they need colostrum just like our farm animal species do. We don't tend to think of it as much in small animal species, but both dogs and cats do require colostrum. And then they're gonna need access to milk every two hours throughout the neonatal period. So outcomes, outcome typically quite good. 99% of bitches survived in one study with aspiration pneumonia being the most common cause of complications and deaths. Puppy survival rate was 87% with 8% delivered stillborn, but often these guys aren't the most healthy of puppies going into it, so that's not too surprising. Brachycephalics did a little bit worse, also not too surprising. <laughs> Complications that are reported have been hemorrhage, hypotension, and laceration of the uterus or other abdominal organs. So after care, we want to take the bitch's temperature once daily for two to three weeks. This is good advice regardless of if she underwent C-section or not. Even if she didn't have a C-section, they are at increased risk for aspiration pneumonia, which of course is what this is a picture of. We want to allow bonding with those puppies. We want to weigh those puppies daily. So they should gain about 5 to 10% of their birth weight per day. So a really common mistake for people to make is to calculate 5 to 10% of their daily weight, which of course would be an exponential gain over the first three weeks or so. So the number will stay the same for the first couple of weeks of life, but they should be consistently gaining. And if they're not, we need to, to investigate. All right, we're going to move on to, to pyometra which is defined as an accumulation of purulent material within the uterus in the presence of high progesterone levels. So this is a diastral disorder. Typically this occurs in older bitches, so usually greater than six years of age, although it can definitely occur in younger. The youngest I've seen it was in a 12 month old dog who was on her first heat cycle, so it definitely can happen usually occurs within 12 weeks of estrus, although in some cases it can have a fairly slow, insidious onset. So even though the initial infection occurred within 12 weeks of estrus, signs may not be noted until later. So cystic endometrial hyperplasia was thought to be kind of the underlying condition, and I think in a lot of cases that is still true. So cystic endometrial hyperplasia occurs from repeated progesterone exposure, as happens with normal heat cycles that this will result in a decreased ability to clear normal bacteria, allowing them to take hold. When that cervix closes with high progesterone, then those bacteria are trapped inside and pyometra can result. Newer research has shown that CEH and pyo can actually arise during the same cycle. So it, this classic complex doesn't always exist, but it's probably responsible for at least a subset of our pyometra girls. Typically, we're looking at normal vaginal flora, so far and away the most common is E. coli. Also can see staph, strep, pseudomonas, proteus, and several others, but usually not big, heavy hitters. Symptoms that we're going to see, vaginal discharge occurs in 85% of cases. You can see lethargy and depression, PUPD, vomiting, diarrhea, and abdominal distension are the biggest symptoms that are reported. We'll often see a neutrophilia plus or minus a left shift. The absolute leukocyte count is kind of variable and in some cases is even low, but that neutrophilia tends to be pretty well conserved. Can also have a mild anemia, either from chronic antigenic stimulation or these girls in diestrus can have a mild anemia as a normal finding. We'll have increased total proteins and globulins due to antigenic stimulation can have azotemia, isosteinuria, and proteinuria. These girls do tend to get a mixed membranoproliferative glomerulopathy from antigen antibody complex deposition. So you can see some kidney dysfunction, which is fortunately typically reversible with resolution of that pyometra. 
can have increased liver enzymes probably due to endotoxin. For diagnosis, clinical suspicion is a big one. Of course, if you have purulent material from the vagina, it's probably a pyometra until proven otherwise. But other things you can use include radiography, plus or minus compression. You do need to rule out pregnancy in this case. Prior to day 45, when fetal mineralization occurs in the bitch, the uterus is going to look like a big fluid-filled tubular structure in the caudal abdomen, which is exactly what a pyometra looks like. So we do need to definitely rule out pregnancy. So that's why we like using ultrasound because it's definitely very obvious if there are puppies or if there is just a fluid-filled uterus. And that's a picture of a, a pyometra uterus there. So surgical treatment is the treatment of choice. So we do like to perform an ovariohysterectomy on these girls, like to stabilize them first, especially if the, the pyometra is open or there is visible external discharge. The success rate is 90%. And the reason I point that out is because there is a tendency for people to look at this as, oh, well, it's just the spay. And yes, it is just the spay. It's not super technically more demanding than a regular spay, but only four out of five survive. So that means one out of five that doesn't. Some of these girls can be quite sick. So I just think it's important to temper your, your client expectations. If you have a closed pyometra, we want to do an immediate ovariohysterectomy. If she's open and stable, you can do an ovariohysterectomy in the morning after stabilizing with fluids and antibiotics overnight. So medical management, patient selection is Super important for medical management of pyometra. These girls need to be young, they need to be valuable breeding bitches, and these owners need to be willing to breed on the next cycle, which we're gonna talk about here in a moment. We do need to use antibiotics, but they are unfortunately not effective alone. Open versus closed is a bit of a question mark. I've managed both successfully medically. Uh, however, the girls who are considered closed are often much more sick than the ones that come in open. People are just much more likely to seek veterinary attention if there is draining pus versus if she's just a little off, maybe drinking a little bit more water than usual, just kind of non-specific ADR type symptoms. So I think the open ones are diagnosed much more quickly than the closed one. So that's associated with a higher likelihood for success. So the medications that you're gonna hear about, of course, are prostaglandin. So this will induce uterine contraction and ultimately decrease progesterone, although it takes quite a while for it to do that. We will have increased success and increased side effects with higher doses. So those are typically related to smooth muscle contraction. So include things like vomiting, diarrhea, abdominal pain. They can at least be partially ameliorated by walking for like five to 20 minutes after you administer that medication. They only should last for about up to an hour. And the other big medication that we hear about is called agliprostone, and this is a progesterone receptor antagonist. So it doesn't do anything to the progesterone itself. Like if you measure the progesterone in the blood, it will still be high, but it binds up those receptors so that it's unable to exert a biological effect. So this is super safe, super effective for both open and closed pyo. There are actually no reported side effects other than pain at the injection site, which of course is just an injection side effect more than a, a drug side effect, if you will. And unfortunately is also not available in the United States. So there are some theriogenologists who have a special variance through the FDA to be able to carry this medication. So certainly if you have a bitch that you think is a good medical management candidate, it is worth a call to your friendly neighborhood theriogenologist to see if they've got this drug in stock. The outcome of medical management is actually very good for survival and that's mostly because we do convert to OHE if we need to. They are going to have decreased fertility, either because there's no treatment for that underlying CEH, so that's not a great spot for a placenta to attach if we've got endometrial hyperplasia there, or potentially there is some residual bacterial infection that kind of hangs out there as well. Recurrence is almost guaranteed. It is extremely likely. It often occurs on the next cycle even, so we do definitely need to breed the next cycle. And we need to keep breeding on back-to-back -back cycles until that owner is done breeding, and then we need to stay. There's actually no medical reason to skip cycles as long as the bitch has not lost 
too much condition through lactation. There's a lot of calorie demand during lactation. So certainly if she's too thin, then we don't want to breed on back-to-back -back cycles. But otherwise, it is totally okay to do so. Okay, we're going to switch gears a little bit and go to postpartum condition. So the first postpartum condition we're going to talk about is SIPs. So that stands for sub-involution of placental sites. In the normal bitch, those trophoblasts, which are a type of placental cell, kind of hang out in the upper lamina propria for about two weeks postpartum. But in SIPs, those trophoblasts continue to invade deeper into the myometrium and even sometimes down even further than that. So what you're going to see is bloody vaginal discharge, especially greater than three weeks postpartum. If you see trophoblasts in cytology, that is pathic mnemonic for this condition. You don't always see them. They can be a bit elusive, but if you see them, then that's definitely what this is. Typically treat these with supportive care. Usually, most commonly, these bitches are perfectly happy. They just have bloody vaginal discharge for a prolonged period after whelping. But every now and again, we will get one that needs a blood transfusion or other types of supportive care. And sometimes it is so severe that we do need to spay. But that is fortunately very rare. Progestrogen has been thought to be a kind of advanced uh, resolution of, of this condition. I have never found the need to use it. And it can lead to other side effects like increasing likelihood for mammary cancer and predisposing to diabetes and things like that. So I don't ever use it, but it is out there. So I did want to mention it. All right, next we've got metritis. So this is a uterine infection in the absence of high progesterone, typically occurs postpartum. Usually those bacteria will ascend when the cervix is open during parturition and get kind of stuck up there. So usually you will see a fetid discharge postpartum. So in normal bitches, the lochia, which is a totally normal finding, should decrease in volume, darken in color, and it should never smell. So if at any point it stinks, or it changes color, especially to a green color, or it gets more voluminous, then that's suspicious for metritis. So we do like to spay these girls, especially if they're systemically ill. Otherwise, we just treat them with supportive care and antibiotics. Oxytocin or prostaglandin can be used. There is a risk of uterine rupture, especially with prostaglandin. Again, I've never found these to be necessary, so I have not used them. Uh, probably these bitches don't have many oxytocin receptors left in their myometrium by the time you go to use this, but you certainly can give it a try. All right, hypocalcemia next. So this is the loss of calcium through lactation. So can also, again, be through fetal mineralization, but that is not very common. Typically, it's young, small breeds with large litters and usually occurs about two to four weeks postpartum when the demands for calcium in the lactation are the highest. So these girls will pre present with stiff gait, trembling, seizures, tachycardia, panting, hyperthermia. They're going to have a low serum ionized calcium. So the treatment is to give IV calcium to effect. And to effect means whenever that stiff gait, trembling, seizures stop. Of course, you do need ECG monitoring while you give this calcium. And then we usually send them home on Tums or another calcium supplement. Uh, the dose is one to four Tums per dog. It is very scientific. All right, last postpartum condition is agalactia. This is just failure of milk production. Most commonly, this is due to premature C-section. Uh, not always, there are some other conditions that can cause agalactia, but typically somebody's doing a C-section based on just a breeding date and the, the puppies aren't totally cooked yet. That's usually why this occurs. Typically treat these girls with domperidone or metoclopramide to enhance milk letdown. All right, we're going to switch to mastitis. So this occurs from ascending bacteria during nursing. This can occur from the environment or from the neonate itself. There's a, quite a bit of evidence in human literature that the bacteria actually comes from the nursing neonate. So these girls are going to present with red, hot, edematous, firm glands and red, brown milk. Ideally, we want to do a culture and cytology of that milk. And then the types are acute, chronic, and gangrenous. So acute meaning very, very sudden, chronic meaning kind of a slow, insidious onset, and gangrenous meaning rotting. <laughs> so if the mastitis is gangrenous, we wean these pups. 
Otherwise, we do allow nursing. It can help strip out the gland. And again, that infection probably came from the neonate, so it's not harmful to have them nurse on, on what we would consider infected milk. Antibiotics, ideally basing your choice off of culture and sensitivity. Uh, if you have a chronic case, you're going to need something with pretty good penetration. So something like Batril or TMS, chloramphenicol, one of those. Otherwise, if it's acute, then probably penetration isn't going to be a huge issue because everything is very inflamed. So we like to use amoxicillin, clavamox, and cephalexin because those are all safe for nursing puppies. You need to lance any abscessed glands, and then you're just going to treat those like an open wound. There is a medication called cabergolin, which can halt lactation within about a week once you start giving it. It is a human medication, so it is available, but because of the tablet sizing, it's really only useful for very large breed dogs, uh, but you can certainly use it if you need. All right, vaginal fold prolapse occurs due to increased sensitivity to estrogen, which leads to edema. So they don't have more estrogen than uh, a normal bitch. They're just more sensitive to the estrogen that's there. So this can be endogenous or an exogenous source. So something like an estrogen cream that some owners will put on can sometimes lead to this. Typically will occur during proestrus or estrus. Every now and again, we'll see it right at parturition, but that's really uncommon. Typically, these are young girls. The floor of the vagina protrudes from the vulva. I've got a picture on the next slide here. The urethra is actually not typically obstructive, and some of these are pretty impressive. So it's, it's kind of crazy that that doesn't happen, but usually we don't have any urethral obstruction to deal with. Uh, that tissue can be ulcerated or necrotic, so important to keep it well lubricated. Here's the picture. <laughs> so the treatment, of course, is to remove the source of estrogen. So we mostly accomplish this by spay. Technically, you could try to induce ovulation to try to get that progesterone up and that estrogen down. This doesn't work super well in dogs. We've not found a great protocol to induce ovulation. So spay is definitely the easier course of action to take. You can reduce that prolapse if needed. Typically, keeping it lubricated and everything is all that's needed. We also want to keep an e-collar on these girls to keep them from self-mutilating. And then, of course, removing any devitalized tissue if it exists. And then important, it's hereditary. So again, we don't necessarily want to induce ovulation in these girls. We want to remove their reproductive potential because this is a hereditary condition. All right, we're going to switch gears and talk about boys next, which is a much shorter topic. So I promise I won't keep you here for too, too much longer. So first, we're going to talk about prostatitis. So benign prostatic hyperplasia occurs secondary to elevated steroid hormones, which in the dog is testosterone. So this is a normal physiologic consequence. Uh, it just happens that the testicles produce testosterone. It's going to lead to some level of BPH. However, that enlarged gland is definitely more susceptible to infection, so that can be ascending or hematogenous. So these guys can actually present with acute abdomen, especially if they have a prostatic abscess that has ruptured, but they can also present with lameness, abdominal pain, definitely pain on prostatic palpation. Often the two lobes of the prostate are asymmetrical can also see blood from the urethra. This can also occur secondary to BPH alone, so we definitely need to do an ultrasound to, to confirm. So BPH looks very uniform. The echo texture is very smooth. Both lobes are equal in size, very uniform. But prostatitis typically looks much more patchy. Those lobes are often different sizes, so it's usually pretty clear on ultrasound if we're dealing with a prostatitis versus just a BPH. So as far as treatment, castration is one option, or you can use a 5-alpha reductase inhibitor. So basically, we need to shrink the size of that gland. Antibiotics are definitely not effective on their own. We need some hormonal treatment as well. So castration, of course, is going to remove testosterone, which is going to remove what's causing that gland to be enlarged. So 5-alpha reductase is actually the enzyme that catalyzes the conversion of testosterone to dihydrotestosterone, which is the active androgen in the prostate. So 
in dogs, they don't rely on DHT for really anything else. So libido, semen parameters, all of that are unaffected by, by finasteride use. That's the, the medication name. And that is a human medication. It's typically fairly well tolerated in dogs. So that's another option as well. For your antibiotics, if it's acute, based them on culture and sensitivity. So you can either do a prostatic wash or you can collect the dog. If he will collect, a lot of them are too painful to do so and culture the prostatic fraction of that ejaculate. If we've got a chronic case, you're going to need good penetration. So this is where Batril, Chloramphenicol, TMS all come into play. If you have an abscess, you may need to surgically omentalize. All right, paraphimosis is the inability to retract the penis back into the sheath. Typically, the cause is idiopathic. We never figure out why exactly this has occurred. It can occur secondary to sexual excitement. Sometimes fractures of the off penis or other kinds of neuropathies can lead to this or sometimes constriction, constriction of the prepucial orifice can lead to paraphimosis. That exposed penis can become necrotic, so it's certainly important to reduce it as soon as possible. So conservative treatment is only appropriate if that penis is healthy. Typically, you can lubricate and replace gently. Helps if you sedate these guys so that it's pretty painful so that they're more amenable to your treatment. You can use sugar solutions and things to try to draw out some of that edema may need to widen that prepucial orifice to get it to go back in. And this is a little bit counterintuitive. A lot of people want to purse string them, but that can be a bit counterproductive because if they come back out again, then it's going to be even a smaller opening to get back through. So sometimes we do widen these guys' prepucial orifices. For surgical treatment, if that penis is necrotic, really amputation and scrotal urethrostomy are your only option. But if the penis is healthy, but that condition is recurrent, you have a couple options. You can do a Bolts procedure, which is actually a large animal procedure where the penis is pulled back and tacked to the, essentially the fascia on like kind of the groin area. Or you can do a prepucial advancement where the skin of the prepuce is advanced forward to cover that exposed penis. All right, testicular torsion is next. Almost always this occurs in abdominal testes, and in fact, in the dog, it's not yet been reported in a scrotal testis, so they often will present with acute abdomen, and we diagnose this with ultrasound using a Doppler showing decreased blood flow to that specific testicle. So treatment, we want to remove, of course, the affected testicle. The contralateral side can be spared. We do expect them to retain about 60 to 70 percent of their fertility with just one. The one kind of makes up for some of the, the slack that the other one has lost, uh, unless that torsion was longstanding. And then you can have breakdown of the blood testicular barrier, which can lead to the formation of anti-sperm antibodies. In general, the body doesn't love haploid cells, so it does create antibodies towards them. Of course, the other side of this is that if this dog is a cryptorchid and has had a testicular torsion in his abdomen, probably should be removing both testicles to not pass that down. So these are all of my references. And I will take questions. All right, and we are live for a, a Q&A session with Dr. Jenna Dockweiler. Thank you very much for that presentation. I know I learned quite a bit, uh, and I'm sure many in the, in the audience did as well. Um, as a quick note on scheduling, this session was scheduled to go through 12 p.m. Eastern, but we, we have a break, so we're going to add 10 minutes or so to do some questions, since I know a lot came in, and then I'll, I'll share some guidance at the end of this about you know, getting ready for the next upcoming session. So um, just to kick it off, would you briefly share just what what led you to be a veterinarian in the first place and why you became passionate about this field of theriogenology? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Well, first of all, thanks for having me and thanks for joining me in uh, this presentation. And certainly if I don't get to all of your questions, feel free to email me. I believe I put my email on that last slide there. So you can always feel free to shoot me an email if I don't get to you. And as far as why I became a veterinarian, I am one of those people who said I was going to be a veterinarian from the time I could talk, potentially before. I've always loved animals, especially dogs. Um, both of my parents are physicians, so I always kind of grew up in the medical field. So it was sort of a natural progression for me to pursue veterinary medicine instead of human medicine. 
And then the theriogenology part of it, I actually grew up showing dogs as well. I grew up with pointers. I have Welsh Springer Spaniels now. There are two of them in this room here with me, so you may they may make an appearance on camera here. Um, but that's why why I became really passionate about the reproduction is because of my background in showing dogs. That's great. That's great. Well, I hope they make an appearance. We'll see. <laughs> Um, so, as you mentioned, we have a, a lot of questions that came in. We'll try to just jump into these and get through them as best we can. So, uh, the first one, um, in a normal at-home birth, is it necessary to attempt to clear nasal pathways? Yeah, so I usually do have my breeders have a bulb syringe at home just in case. It's not typically as big of a problem with natural whelping because those puppies obviously don't come out anesthetized. So if they come out and they're already hollering, they will probably do quite a lot of the clearing of the airways themselves, but it's not harmful to clear out some of that mucus with a bulb syringe. Great. Great. And next one, what are the common or primary reasons for resorption of puppies and fetal demise, or I'm sorry, fetal demise? Yeah, so resorptions, which happen prior to fetal, fetal mineralization, which occurs around day 45 or so of gestation, if it's one puppy that resorbs and the remainder of the litter is okay and develops normally, it's probably something that was a bit genetically amiss with that specific puppy. So it's not one that you necessarily want to, to survive to whelping. But if the whole litter resorbs, that can be anything, any type of infection. Um, brucellosis can lead to, to early fetal resorption in some cases, any type of systemic illness from the dam. So there are a wide variety of, of causes that potentially could lead to. Got it. Got it. OK. And um, let's see, what is the literature that supports back to back breeding? Yeah, so it's not so much the literature that supports the back-to-back -back breeding, it's the lack of literature that says you have to skip cycles, if, if that makes sense. So if uh, you go to my next presentation, which is Breeding Management of the Bitch, I'm going to get into the, the whole cycle of the dog really a lot more in depth. But essentially, the dog cycle pretends that the dog is pregnant for um, whether or not she's bred. So she has a period of very high progesterone that lasts for essentially the entire gestation length. So her body thinks that she's pregnant, regardless of if she's pregnant, if she's bred and just didn't get pregnant, if she was never bred. So she goes through essentially all the motions hormonally of being pregnant. And that high progesterone can actually lead to some damage of the endometrium or the inner lining of the uterus, which could potentially predispose to pyometra later on. So as long as she hasn't lost too much condition. There are some bitches that do lose quite a lot of weight during lactation because the calorie demands during lactation are quite high. If that happens, then I wouldn't necessarily recommend breeding back to back because we need her to gain some weight, get a little bit more condition before we breed her again. But otherwise, she thinks she's pregnant regardless. So we always say a healthy uterus is a pregnant uterus. Got it. Got it. Um, I was going to save this one because I thought there was a couple other spay questions, but I don't see them now. So I'll just go back to that here. Um, it's a question about veterinary schools not teaching ovary sparing spay um, when several breeds have hormone sensitive cancer risks, such as Goldens, Poodles, Boxers. Can you comment on that at all? Yeah, yeah. So the, the cancer risks are, we're sort of just beginning to, to uncover what all of those are. So I just want to point out that that's like a very, it's early in the in the process of discovering exactly which cancers and which breeds and, and so on and so forth are susceptible to cancer. So ovary sparing spay is in anybody who doesn't know that's where one or both ovaries are left in place on purpose and the entire uterus is removed. Um, so essentially it prevents pregnancy, but leaves the hormones intact. So the bitch still cycles. She doesn't tend to bleed much when she cycles, but she still will cycle fairly normally um, and otherwise be a normal intact bitch. You know, she'll attack, attract males, she'll stand to be mounted, all of that stuff. So a few things with, with this procedure. One, it's pretty technically demanding because you have to get all of the pieces of uterus out um, in order to prevent any kind of pyometra from developing. So that's one thing. It's a bit difficult to do correctly. The next is, of course, she's still going to attract males. And there actually have been a few cases of dogs that were bred after an ovary sparing spay and ended up with peritonitis. 
from a rupture of that cranial vagina, which one of those dogs of the two that I know of actually did pass away. So that's, you know, another certainly bad complication. And then it certainly doesn't remove the risk of ovarian cancer, which fortunately in dogs is rare, but when it happens is pretty bad. So I would say those are kind of the drawbacks of, of ovary sparing spay. So I don't tend to recommend it myself. I would just say if you're going to, to leave your bitch intact for a certain period of time, just leave her intact and don't have her around male dogs. But I would suspect that those are the reasons that, that it hasn't become more of a mainstream procedure. Got it. Got it. Um, all right, so another question here. Can you go over again uh, monitoring neonatal weight gain? Is it 5 to 10% birth weight per day? How long do you use that measure? Yeah, yeah. So it is 5 to 10% of the birth weight per day. So the mistake that people make is calculating 5 to 10% of the daily weight, which of course is an exponential increase. Like we can't expect that of, of puppies. So like if a 600 gram puppy she, he should gain 30 to 60 grams per day for about the first three weeks. And usually at about three weeks, I kind of breathe a sigh of relief. Like if we've gotten this far, we're probably going to be okay. It just seems to be when they're a little bit more hardy. So I usually use that measure for about the first three weeks. Got it. Got it. Um, so we have time just for one or two more. Um, so a number of questions here. Does anything stand out to you that you want to make sure to comment on? Otherwise, I can, I have uh, a lot more. So the, just back on the ovary sparing spay, this is the first one that I see that there shouldn't be any blood if the complete uterus is removed in an ovary sparing spay. But oftentimes they're not done perfectly correctly. So if you, you know, sometimes there is a little bit of uterine tissue left and you can see a little bit of blood. Um, Got it. And I, I know the um, your next presentation in about a half hour, 20 minutes on responsible breeding practices may may touch upon at least some of these topics. Um, there was I know just and just as a reminder too for the veterinarians in the audience, this um, session has been submitted for CE credit. Um, so we will follow up with everyone after the event to, to verify if CE credit is provided and how to um, get your participation certificates. Um, I guess this is like a, maybe a final question because I know there's many other questions here that we'll try to respond via text or chat and people can always go to the Embark booth for ongoing uh, chat over the day. But um, Dr. Dockweiler, given uh, many general practitioners that are veterinarians are not reproductive specialists, but they'll encounter, you know, many of the kind of conditions you highlighted as well as for that matter, many of the breeders watching might encounter these conditions and bring them to their vet or not be sure where to go. Can you just comment a little bit on the, the kind of topic where general practitioner veterinarians may be faced with this, and then there's question of if and when to refer to a specialist? Yeah, yeah, sure. So first, the, the way to find a specialist is to go to seriogenology.org. That's our American College of Seriogenologists website and you can search like do a member search and find somebody in your area and it breaks it down by species of interest so if you needed somebody who is canine feline you certainly could find them that way um, for breeders and veterinarians serio.org is the society for seriogenology which includes the board of specialists and people who just have a special interest in reproduction uh, so they can certainly help you out too. And same thing, you can do a member search. And then as far as when to refer, I would say anytime you're not comfortable and certainly you can always pick up the phone and, and give one of us a call. You know, we're usually pretty happy to help out via phone as well if we can. Um, but any kind of like vaginal or prepucial discharge or pregnancy questions or, or anything of that nature. Um, and even if there's spayed or neutered pets that have issues with any of their reproductive organs, we're always happy to take a look at that as well. Terrific. Terrific. Well, thank you again very much for your presentation. Um, as I said, highly informative and uh, we're very much looking forward to your next one. So uh, for now, just as a kind of a general message to everyone viewing this, we have a short break until 12.30 p.m. Eastern. And I wanted to highlight two features of the conference you could take advantage of during this time or any time. One is, as I mentioned a moment ago, the Embark booth. If you click on lobby, you can go to Embark booth and then there's a chat button on the top left. That's staffed by representatives from Embark, including members of our science department and other departments 
who can comment upon a number of, of specific or technical questions you might have about canine health. So please feel free to use that resource. Additionally, this, this uh, Canine Health Summit has a really neat networking feature where any attendee can send a message to any other attendee. And the way you can do this is, is back in the lobby, there's a, a chat box in the bottom right or a chat icon. You can click on that and view all of the other attendees' names and click someone to send a message to, and then you can click add people after the chat window is open. So a pretty neat way to network with others um, from around the world that are attending here live. Um, and then lastly, one other quick reminder, we have the gamification uh, game going on where you can win prize packs. And you can click in the lobby the gamification icon. There's also a leaderboard, and I have it uh, up over here. I see the, the top five right now. Danielle, Tanya, Lisa, Sarah, and Kim are our, our top five on the leaderboard. So if you want to catch up to them, follow the gamification uh, guidance over today and tomorrow. Um, so that's it for right now. We'll be back in about 15 minutes. One, uh, or I should say you have two options at, at that time, which is a second presentation by Dr. Jenna Dockweiler speaking on responsible breeding practices. Um, and the other option is a presentation by Dr. Sam Hauser speaking on why should we consider genetic COI in breeding decisions? So we will see you then.